If timing is the most crucial element in all of music, then why do guitar geeks cringe when the word metronome is mentioned? Well, they cringe for two reasons. Number one, it's hard or difficult to play with. And number two, it's boring. Well, in today's show, I'm gonna teach you how to easily use the metronome and how to actually have fun with it. Hey, TAC family, welcome to episode 189 of the Acoustic Tuesday Show. This show is all about bringing fun, focus, and progress to your guitar journey through my weekly Guitar Geek list, plus success stories from your fellow TAC members. Speaking of, how many times have you said, gosh, I'd really love to play guitar today, but I just don't have the time? Chances are you may have said that on more than one occasion. Well, today you're gonna learn how to get creative so that you can maintain the regularity of your guitar routine. You'll be meeting TAC member Sarah W whose guitar routine is her saving grace, and she's learned a way to maintain its regularity even with a busy family life. You're also gonna get your weekly dose of acoustic guitar news you can use, which includes a brand new builder to me, and likely to you as well, plus an incredible guitar connection that happened in Texas, and uh, so much more. But first, let's visit our clicky compadre, yes, the metronome. I'm gonna teach you how to use it and to actually have fun with the darn thing. There's this common guitar geek myth that you should be able to turn on the metronome and immediately play along with it. That couldn't be further from the truth. You have to learn how to use the metronome. You have to learn how to play with it. And so often that step gets skipped. And in place of it, what gets inserted is, I can't play with the metronome, so I may as well not play with it at all. You can play with the metronome. Today, I'm gonna to be sharing with you five steps on how to easily play with the metronome so that you can actually have some fun and understand timing. I'll be taking you into the studio and demonstrating each step so you can hear it, and if you want, you can play along with me. So with that being said, let's go ahead and dive into each and every step. Well, there's really five of them, so you can play with the metronome and have some fun. Step number one is the metronome is dead to me. I know that that's a goofy name for a step, but before you jump in whole hog with the metronome, you have to get in sync with it. And the way you do that is by playing dead strums in both quarter notes and eighth notes. Let me actually show you what I'm talking about. The idea behind the dead strum is that it limits the moving parts, meaning you're not worried about chords, scales, licks, or single notes, or any of that. You're simply worried about getting your picking hand in sync with the click of the metronome. With your fretting hand, just simply hold the strings down, and with your picking hand, all you're gonna do is strike the strings to get that percussive or dead sound, like this. Now, I'll be setting the metronome at 60 beats per minute. And at first, I'm just gonna do a dead strum on the downbeat. So if I was to count the clicks, one, two, three, four, there would be a down strum on all of those clicks. After I go through a couple rounds of that, I'm gonna integrate the eighth note. So the count moves to one and two and three and four and. And you're gonna note that on those and beats, I'm gonna be using an upstroke. Step number two is to test your timing. The way that you do this is by having the metronome skip a beat or two or skip an entire measure. Playing with the metronome while it skips a beat sounds difficult and intimidating, but it's actually a really fun challenge. One that helps bolster your confidence when it comes to rhythm and timing. It really develops your internal clock. So here's how this is gonna work. The first pass, the metronome is gonna click on all four beats. I'm gonna play a basic one finger per fret warm up in an eighth note rhythm. One and two and three and four and. You'll be hearing the clicks on the one, two, three and four. The next round, you're gonna be hearing the clicks on the one and the three. I'll be responsible for maintaining the timing through the two beat and the four beat, which again will be absent. And then the final round, the metronome's only gonna click on the one beat. I'll be responsible for maintaining the rhythm through the two, three, and the four beat. And then it's gonna come back on one. So I'll get a real sense of how well I'm doing. And again, this is not a pass fail situation. This is a fun way to suss out whether you're speeding up or slowing down and where you can improve upon that in your guitar journey.
Step number three is to make it musical. What I want you to do is take your metronome and set it aside and cue up a drum track. Yes, a drum track, something musical that you can play along to. Now that you've learned how to get in sync with the metronome, now that you've tested your internal metronome, it's time to enter the musical arena. One of my absolute favorite things to do while playing with a drum track is to play a scale and practice improvisation, but really focusing on the rhythmic element of it, not so much on the harmonic element of it. Because we don't have a backing track, we don't really have to pay attention to what note works over what chord. It's more about playing single notes in time allowing for space and then playing again, or playing a bunch of notes and then allowing for more space. It's a really fun exercise and because it's a drum track, it's extremely musical. So for this example, I'll be playing the A minor pentatonic scale along with a basic drum track. Think like kind of a basic rock style groove. Now the A minor pentatonic scale, if you don't know it, looks like this. It starts out on the fifth fret, on the low E string, it's the fifth fret, the eighth fret. On the A string, it's the fifth and the seventh. On the D, it's the 5th and the 7th. On the G, it's the 5th and the 7th. The B is the 5th and the 8th. And the high E is the 5th and the 8th. Now, you can play that in a linear fashion, meaning one note right after the next, or you can mix and match. But the idea here is to play in time and pay attention to rhythm. Okay, here we go. Step number four is to boil the frog. Tone, what the hell are you talking about? This one has to do with speed. The metronome can be used, the power of the metronome can be channeled to help you actually play faster. And you do this in small increments. Like that old wives tale where if you're like boiling a frog, the slow increase in temperature makes the frog realize that it's not even getting hotter or something like that. I probably butchered it. But that same philosophy is true with the metronome. If you're playing something and you want to become faster at it, what I want you to do is each pass, I want you to increase the tempo of the metronome by five beats per minute. It's almost imperceptible, but the effect it has on you being able to play faster is enormous. I'm going to start the metronome at 60 beats per minute. And each round, I'm going to up the metronome by five beats per minute. And I'm going to do so all the way to 90 beats per minute. Now, I'm just going to be playing on the low two strings of the guitar to save time. But I think you'll notice the compound effect of this. It's pretty crazy. And the wild thing is, is as you're doing it, you don't even perceive that you're playing faster. Step number five is 10 minutes and take a break. This is the most important step I'm gonna share with you today. And it doesn't even involve me going to the studio or playing anything on the guitar. It's quite simply to spend 10 minutes of time with the metronome and then take a break. Set the metronome aside and go about your playing session for the day. I want you to think of it like this. It's like adding pennies to a piggy bank. At the time, it doesn't seem like much money but over time it adds up. And when you crack that piggy bank open, you can take a vacation. The same is true with the metronome. Each small 10 minute chunk that you spend with the metronome adds up. And over time, your relationship with rhythm, timing, and tempo will become that much better. It will have a ton of benefits for your guitar playing. You'll be able to play with other musicians easier. You're gonna be able to record easier. You'll be able to play songs by yourself easier. And ultimately, you'll have this confidence and command over your guitar that you didn't have before. So yes, play with the metronome for 10 minutes and then take a break. Those little time chunks add up big time. That's kind of a pun, big time. Anyways, this is where I want you, guitar geeks watching, to chime in. In the comments below, let me know your biggest roadblock when it comes to using a metronome. And don't be shy, let me know. If it's just intimidating to you, you can tell me that. Or if it's simply, gosh, I can't seem to get in sync with it. 
just let me know in the comments below. Conversely, if you've enjoyed using a metronome, if you've learned how to use the metronome over the last year, five years, 10 years, let me know a tip that you'd like to share with your fellow guitar geeks, again, in the comments below. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that you're pressed for time. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that all of us guitar geeks are pressed for time, which is why I continually say that it's important that we have a regular and consistent guitar routine so that we can actually get our guitar playing in when life is crazy. But what happens when you literally just don't have the time? Well, you have to get creative. And TAC member Sarah W has done that very thing. But first, I wanna give you a glimpse into Sarah's guitar life and how it was when she didn't have a guitar routine. It was quite random and quite chaotic, as she and her kids will attest to. Here she is. So my guitar life before Tony's Acoustic Challenge was really random, pretty lost. I had no idea really what I was doing. Uh, I just watch random YouTube videos. My son's in the background laughing because he says all I ever did was try and play Let It Go to my daughter in the evenings. Um, terribly. Haven't got back to that yet. Uh, yeah, I was aimless. I was asking my muso friend question after question, trying to piece together theory. But basically, I was completely lost and I was getting nowhere. Felt like I was in massive rut. Okay, now you've seen Sarah's life prior to her having a regular guitar routine. She's since developed a solid and regular guitar routine, but she's had to get creative because, well, family life is pretty darn busy. She's found a way to have her kids do chores while she gets to play guitar. But rather than me try and describe that, here's Sarah talking about her regular guitar routine and how big of an impact it's actually had on her guitar life. So having a consistent routine, I'm now playing every single day without fail, 10 minutes a day at least, but I always end up playing for much longer. I'm looking forward to it. I have set up a routine in the evening where my kids do the dishes, they clean up the kitchen while I do the daily challenges. And that's, I've got focus now. I, moving forward, I can see that the skills that I'm learning in the daily challenges are actually, I can, I can play the songs that I never used to be able to play before that were so out of my reach and I can definitely see a consistent improvement and I'm looking forward to it and the more skills I gain the more fun it is so I'm just I'm loving it I my guitar one of my guitars is always in my car and I take it to work and I play at lunchtime at work and I'm now playing in front of everybody at work I even jammed with one of the guys the other day, he sang and I played, I sang along a little bit too. That was the first time I've ever kind of jammed, I guess. So definitely the consistent routine has changed my guitar life. Huge thank you to Sarah for sharing that with us. And I think it's so valuable to bear witness to another guitar geek's guitar journey and to see the roadblocks that they encounter. And more importantly, how they overcome those roadblocks because we can use that to gain new perspective on our own guitar journeys. I just think it's incredible. And again, I can't thank Sarah enough for sharing that with us. In fact, we're not done hearing from Sarah. Lo and behold, Sarah has submitted a guitar signal for us to gaze upon. So here is Sarah W's guitar signal. Now, Sarah is from McMahon's Creek, Victoria, Australia. And here is what she has in her guitar signal. First up, a Maiden Performer. Next, a Yamaha FG Junior, which she says lives in my ute and comes everywhere with me. Next, a Sunflower Slide, which is an old beat up sweet tone that she's painted and is renovating into a slide guitar. Next, a Garage Guitars custom made Strat with an Australian Blackwood body. And finally, a Bluebird Ukulele. And again, thanks to Sarah for rising to the occasion. Not only did she share her guitar journey with us, not only did she share her guitar signal with us, she's also taught me a new word. Ute. Apparently, that's a pretty common term in Australia, and it's short for utility coop, I believe. I had to look it up. After I read her guitar song, I thought, I've never heard that word before. I must know it. So thank you, Threefold Sarah. And if you're sitting there thinking, I have a guitar signal that I want to share on the Acoustic Tuesday show. I want to be just like Sarah. Well, I'm asking you to please do so. All you have to do is follow three simple steps. Step number one, go to AcousticTuesday.store and buy yourself your favorite guitar signal shirt, 
hoodie, sweatshirt, you name it, it's there. Step number two, when that shirt arrives, go ahead and put it on and take a picture amongst all of your guitars, just like Sarah did. And step number three, please upload your picture at AcousticLife.tv. Once you're there, click on the submit link in the top menu and you can upload your picture and describe what is in your guitar arsenal for all of us guitar geeks to have a look at. Let's go ahead and hop in the Acoustic Tuesday time machine, which of course is fueled on broken strings and lost guitar picks. And we're gonna head back to episode 185 of the show where I talked about mariachi music and the instruments used in a mariachi band setting and the techniques we can take from those instruments and apply to the guitar. Now, as I mentioned in that episode, I'm brand new to mariachi music. I'm learning things for the very first time. And the comments on that show were incredible. I was nervous about doing that show, but after reading the comments, I was pretty darn excited about that show. And in fact, in the comments, I learned even more. So let me go ahead and dig in. This first one comes from Carlos Gonzalez, and he says this, thank you for bringing these techniques into the limelight and making them more accessible. I used to be a mariachi and I appreciate that you're introducing people to the techniques. Well, Carlos, thank you for watching. And gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be bringing these, these techniques into the limelight as well. As I mentioned in that show, by no means am I a master at any of these techniques, but I do find the link between other instruments and the guitar fascinating. So again, Carlos, thanks for the comment and uh, thanks for the, the kind words. Our next comment comes from Oscar Sanchez T. And he says this, this is one of the lessons that I learned. Here, here's what he says. All great content, my friend, but one small thing here. The bajo quinto, bajo sexto, is not used in mariachi, but rather a different Mexican music genre called norteño. Very characteristic by the usage of an accordion, as well as a mixture between local Mexican music and German, Austrian, Czech folk music. I love this. This is exactly why I love the comments section from that episode. I had never even heard of Norteño music, and now I have a whole other genre of music to explore. So thank you very much, Oscar, for that educational comment. Very, very much appreciated. Our next comment comes from Zach Costilla, and he says this, I grew up in my grandparents' and father's Mexican restaurant, so there was always mariachi music on the jukebox, and often live Friday and Saturday nights. I have loved it all my life. It drove me to check out all kinds of Latin music, and I especially love flamenco and Andean folk music. Andean? Andean folk music. I'm not sure how to exactly say that. Uh, he says this, the vihuela technique is also used in various flamenco rhythms. You can get a requinto, which is small like the vihuela, but tuned like a guitar with a capo on the fifth fret. You'd use a lot of the same techniques, but it might simplify the playing. The vihuela is small like a ukulele, but much deeper body, and tuned like a lute. Very cool stuff. And again, another lesson learned. And now I have to check out the Requinto. And Zach wasn't the only person to mention the Requinto. I should say that. There were a couple of recommendations for me to check out the Requinto and some of its techniques and kind of use uh, using those techniques on the guitar. So just all in all, a whirlwind of great information on that show, both in the show and derived from the show in the comments section. Uh, and there are also a couple of Really interesting Guitar Geek lessons that I gleaned from that show, again, from the comments. The first one was from Matthew D, Matthew Drell. He says this, hey Tony, so it's been a bummer month. At the beginning of April, I broke my elbow while I was skateboarding. It's my fretting arm. So at first I was devastated to realize I can't play for a while, but then I realized because of the tack philosophy, I can always do something. So I've been working on my picking hand. I tuned my guitar to open D so that it at least sounds pretty. And so I've just been working on my rolls and different finger style techniques. I just want to encourage others out there. If one limb goes down, there's always still a way to play and move forward. Thank you for all you do, Tony. Can't wait to, can't wait to get back to, to full playability. Matthew, your attitude is so awesome. And I can't thank you enough for sharing that. Um, I think so often an injury can occur or some, some, something that limits playing ability and it's like all hope is lost. But here Matthew, you know, broke his elbow of his fretting his fretting arm and he's saying, "You know what? At first it was a little it was a tough pill to swallow." And I I can imagine that. But he's saying, "You know what? I've been able to focus on my right hand technique, finger picking rolls, finger picking styles." And 
what a what an absolute awesome way to make you know lemon lemonade out of lemons. I almost said lemons out of lemonade. That's that's pretty cool if you can do that. But uh, Matthew, thank you so much for sharing that. And it just goes to show, man. There's oh there is always something you can do to better your playing. Whether it's thinking about the guitar, just working on one hand's technique. Um, so many options, and and Matthew is proof of that. Plus he gives a. A little, little bit of a shot of inspiration to other guitar geeks that might be struggling with playing limitations. And our final comment really was, I'm going to paraphrase some of this because it's, it's a lot and I don't want to read the entirety of it. Uh, in fact, if you want to read the entirety of it, please visit episode 185. But to me, this just shows the, the, the beautiful nature of this guitar geek community. Nancy S. submitted a comment and she said, hey, you know, I'm from Germantown, Maryland. I've actually, I have my guitar signal shirt but I'm scared to share it because I don't have any Martins, Taylors, or Gibsons. I only have four guitars. One that is strictly a wall hanger. It was my father's and it's too expensive to fix, but maybe one day. She also says, thanks for everything you do. Today's gonna be my first tack lesson. And what I loved about this is, is Nancy's comment and just how genuine it was, but also the replies from both Aleda and VW Beetle 72 Jelly Bean. <laughs> Hopefully you got that right. Um, and essentially what they, what they said was, I'm gonna read a latest uh, response because it's so good. She says, Nancy, to me, the guitar community is all about lifting each other up and supporting each other's guitar journey, not about the number of and what brand name guitars you have. Passion and determination and fun is what it's all about. So please share your collection, rock on sister. And then VW Beetle, a 72 Jelly Bean, Jelly Bean basically seconds what uh, Aleda said. And I have to say, it's comments like these that make me realize how truly precious, if I can say that, this Guitar Geek community is. Everyone that's here that watches the show is here to lift one another up and, and help one another out on their guitar journey, whatever that means. We have beginners that watch the show. We have, we have folks that have been playing a long time, but regardless of skill level and, and time invested in the guitar, we're all here for one reason, and that is to have fun and help each other out on their guitar journey. Well, I guess that's two reasons, but they kind of, they kind of segue uh, into, into one another. Now on to the final segment of the show, and that is indeed acoustic news you can use. And I have to say that I wasn't planning on sharing this on today's show, but I, I, I want to. Uh, we're gonna start out the acoustic news section on a little bit of a somber note. And one of my musical friends here in Bozeman uh, passed away. Uh, this is some weeks ago, and it's taken me some time to personally process it. And um, it was really shocking to hear uh, this is somebody that I played duo gigs with um, for quite some time. I want to say probably the greater end of five years here in Bozeman. And um, it was incredibly sad to to hear the news. And my heart goes out to his family, his friends, his other musical, musical uh, friends here in town. And I thought to myself, one of the things that I learned was how to be in the moment. Because this, this person that I played with, his name was Joe, um, he was the best at being in the moment. We could be at a gig and he would call a song that we had never played before and he would briefly teach it to me in about five seconds and then he would launch into the song. And I guess there were two things that he taught me. Sorry, I'm kind of processing this out loud right now, but uh, there were two things that he taught me. One was to be in the moment and the second was um, he just bestowed a lot of confidence in the people that he surrounded himself with and I don't know if I necessarily made that connection at that point in time. Um, I, I certainly realize it now, but I guess the reason I'm sharing this with all of you is because number one, we're kind of a guitar geek family, but number two, um, always really value the people that you share music with, be it a teacher, somebody you talk about music with, somebody that simply hears you play music, um, it is such a powerful tool and music is such a powerful teacher that we really need to treat it with the utmost respect because it is such a powerful force. And uh, I wanna thank Joe for, for teaching me that. Um, so it's my little tribute to Joe. Uh, cheers, Joe. Uh, thank you very much for being um, a part of my musical life and, and for allowing me to be a part of your musical life. Uh, that being said, let me kick it over to Matt at Eddie's Guitars on a little bit of a lighter note. Uh, he's got a new builder that he wants to share, a, a, a new guitar builder that he wants to share with you. His name is Jeff Jewett, and there's a little bit of trivia embedded in, in um, Matt's video here, but I'll let Matt go ahead and take it away. You gotta check out this guitar. It's pretty darn amazing. 
Hey there, Tony and all my friends at Acoustic Tuesday. It's been a while, but uh, we're back. This is Matt with Eddie's Guitars coming to you as always from St. Louis, Missouri. And Tony, I thought of you right away. I've got a guitar that actually just came in a couple of days ago and uh, you came to mind right away, I've got to say. I think this is a guitar you would really appreciate. This comes from a new builder that we're now representing here at Eddie's. This is the Jewett Guitars Double OC. And uh, like I said, Tony, this is a, a sweet little guitar. I know you like those small body guitars. They do the, uh, the finger style thing super well. And I, I just thought this would be right up your alley. Um, Jeff Jewett might ring a bell. The name Jeff Jewett might ring a bell because he's actually been in the Finnish business uh, regarding instruments for a long time now. In fact, Tony, your, your uh, Santa Cruz vintage Southerner you have there, the sunburst on that guitar, you can thank Jeff for that finish. He, he made that. So he's, uh, he supplies um, some of your and I's favorite luthiers with the finish and colorants that they use in their finishes and is now building his own guitars. And man, I'm blown away by these things. Um, again, we've got a double O cutaway here. This is a short scale guitar, 24.9 inch scale length. And um, tons of access up high on the neck here. You can see with this beautiful Florentine cutaway here. We've got a beautiful Adirondack spruce top. This is a master grade red Adirondack spruce top on this guitar. It has a great woody sound to it, very strong fundamentals, just a real good clear sound out of this top. So just a beauty of a soundboard here. Back and sides of this guitar are beautifully flamed maple. And man, I'll tell you, the, the flame maple in this small body here really sounds good. You can see that dark black ebony back strip going all the way down the center of the back. And the whole guitar is framed in that nice uh, bold ebony binding there as well. So a beautiful guitar. Um, like I said, I was just anxious to share this with you and, and all the folks there at Acoustic Tuesday. I, I think you folks might get a kick out of this guitar. This, like I said, is the first guitar that we've received from Jeff, but we have a few more guitars on the way in from him right now. Uh, so I'll be anxious to get those in as well. Uh, this guitar is on our website now. So if you guys have any questions about it or any future guitars that we have coming from Jewett Guitars, certainly shoot me a line and, uh, and you can view our full demo on this guitar as well. Thanks a bunch, Tony. Hope all is well in Montana. Always great to hear from Matt. Matt is just the, this font of guitar geek knowledge. Whether it's a new builder, a new player, different tonewood combinations, he always seems to have his ear to the ground. So it's always great to hear from Matt and uh, certainly great to see you on the Acoustic Tuesday show again. Thanks a lot, Matt. We appreciate you. Um, I want to go over a couple more news items. I'm going to wrap things up on an interesting guitar geek connection. But before we do that, there was a there's a player that I should have known about, but I didn't. His name is Stanley Jordan. He's a jazz guitar player, originally born in Chicago, grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I had never seen him play before. I'd never heard him play before. He just wasn't on my radar. He should have been. Uh, a truly incredible composer. And I say composer because once you see how he plays, his brain seems to think like a composer. He's able to play so many parts of a single song on just the guitar. 
Here is him playing Eleanor Rigby in 1986 at the Newport Jazz Festival. It's simply mind-blowing. Ladies and gentlemen, Stanley Jordan. The final piece of news that I have for you today is an interesting guitar geek connection. It involves Mule Resonator guitars. Matt from Mule went down to the Texas Guitar Show. I think it was the Texas International Guitar Show or Vintage Guitar Show. I can't remember which show it was, but he went there to uh, put on display some Mule Resonator guitars so the good guitar geeks of Texas and elsewhere could get their hands on a mule and actually see how amazing those instruments are. Well, he met another guitar geek there that happened to be the second owner of a very special Mule Resonator guitar. Here's how the story goes. This is Trevor, a longtime Mule fan. We've talked and he's a great guy, super great, I could tell. He found a used Mule a couple years ago and loved it. I've been away for the Dallas Guitar Show and he sent me a message and said he was coming and had something for me. He brought that cool Damascus Steel Texas in the next picture. I fidgeted with it for four days. There was a group of us talking and Trevor told me the story of how he found his mule and mentioned the name inside his guitar, Randy T. My heart got a bit heavy and a bit happy. That guitar was made in the basement shop, number 114. Randy had sent me an email to get on the wait list and had explained that he had cancer and was gonna die. Part of his plan was to get the instruments he dreamed of and to support makers while he did it. My brother and I started his guitar right away. We made a video for him on YouTube called Randy's Patina on how we did the process. He got the guitar and loved it. I believe how it went was one of Randy's family members got a hold of me later to say Randy died and that the guitar would be moving on to its next owner. That owner was Trevor. This post could be about how buying handmade things has a special quality to it, and it does. But that's just my mechanism for connection to people, and it may or may not apply to you. This post is about mechanisms for connection to people. Finding your way to find and be around your people. Making it a priority. Making the stories, learning about each other, adding value to each other's lives, looking them in the face. It's easy to lose track of the value of the intangible parts of our lives. Our experiences, our relationships, our mental health. Without intention, without assigning value to them, without figuring out what that means and how to act, it's easy for those things to slip away. We might wake up later and wonder what we've lost. Or it might be so gradual we never become aware of it. Again, I think this goes circles back to music has this intrinsic power, and one of those powers is to be able to connect with your people, as, as Matt said. I don't want to steal his, his words, but I think that's a, a great note to end the Acoustic Tuesday show on for today. But before I officially end the show, let's take a sneak peek into next week. And next week, we're going to ponder a guitar building question, and that is, is it the materials or is it the design that makes the guitar sound the way that it does. What makes the guitar sound amazing? Is it strictly the materials on the spec sheet or is it the way those materials are treated? We're gonna go ahead and uh, take on that question in next week's episode of Acoustic Tuesday. That being said, I wanna make sure you never miss an episode of Acoustic Tuesday, so please be sure to check out Acoustic Tuesday, well, every single Tuesday at 10 a.m. here on YouTube. I wanna thank you so much for watching the show today. I wanna to thank you so much for sharing your time with me. And please remember one thing, your guitar success, your guitar progress, however you define it, is directly related to your guitar routine, as we noticed in Sarah's story. So please invest the time in your guitar routine and make sure to have fun every single day you play. Thank you so much for being a guitar geek. Thank you again for watching the show. Guitar Geeks Unite, and I'll see you next Tuesday on the Acoustic Tuesday Show. Cheers. <laughs>